I'm John Taylor. I'm assistant professor of agroecology in the Department of Plant Sciences and Entomology here at URI. I also teach in the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems program. I grew up on a farm in western Pennsylvania, and I'm descended from five generations of Pennsylvania dirt farmers, basically. However, it took me a while to come back to agriculture and eventually get a PhD in crop sciences from the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, where I studied urban agriculture in the south side of Chicago. My research focuses on urban agriculture and small-scale agricultural systems, and so I really love the multidisciplinary nature of my research, and I just really enjoy learning what people are doing in their gardens and farms. I really love to teach project-based classes, and I think that really comes out of my uh, training as a landscape architect, my studio training as a landscape architect because it's just a great way for students to apply the principles and practices that they learn about in class to real life situations. And while I wanted them to like come away from my class with the information and the skills that they need to help create sustainable, resilient, and equitable food systems. So they're not only producing food, but they're also helping to heal um, social rift in urban neighborhoods, for instance, and they're a real like social and cultural resource. Well, of course I am an avid gardener and um, I've recently become interested in urban agroforestry, in particular forest gardens, and so I'm developing a forest garden on the lot beside my house. So a forest garden is basically in agroecology, I'm an agroecologist, and so in agroecology, we look to natural systems as models for agricultural systems. And so the food forest is based basically on a natural forest, um, but you use productive plants for all of the layers of the food forest, from the canopy trees, to the shrub layer, to the ground layer of vegetation. Uh, well, I want people to come away um, from my research with the idea that these are like highly sustainable systems, um, that they are contributing to the quality of urban life, um, that they are in fact like more sustainable in some ways than the large scale production systems that we really rely on in our larger food system. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karen LaPointe, and on behalf of the URI Foundation and Alumni Engagement, I'd like to welcome you to our program today. We are happy to present the final program in our spring semester faculty office hour series, where we've been exploring the theme of sustainability. And today we welcome John Taylor, Assistant Professor of Agroecology in the Department of Plant Sciences and Entomology. Acting as moderator of the discussion is Catherine Weaver, a URI alum with degrees in landscape architecture and anthropology. Catherine is the founder, chief vision officer, and artistic director of Tupelo Design Studio, a landscape architecture firm located in North Kingstown, Rhode Island. She is an adjunct faculty member in the URI Landscape Architecture Department and is also past president and current board member of the Rhode Island Nursery and Landscape Association. If you have questions for Professor Taylor, please post them in the chat section on your screens. We'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can after the presentation. And just a note, today's program will be recorded. In a few days, for those who registered for the event, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording, along with recommended resources for further reading. You'll also be receiving a very brief survey from us, and we welcome your feedback. Now, it gives me great pleasure to turn the program over to Catherine. Thank you, Karen, and welcome everyone. We're so pleased that you chose to spend this very dreary uh, lunch hour with us and in the um, company of Professor Taylor. I'm so pleased to introduce Professor Taylor, who is an assistant professor of agroecology in the Department of Plant Sciences and Entomology. Professor Taylor's research focuses on urban agriculture, community food forests, and the planning and design of urban green infrastructure, including multifunctional urban agriculture. This afternoon, he will share some of his latest research with examples of community food forests around the country and the world. Really looking forward to this. I'll turn it over to you, John. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Catherine. Um, I'm just really excited to be here today and thank you everyone for joining us. I'd like to just, um, say a special shout out to my parents and my sister and brother-in-law um, who are in the audience. And I'm just excited to talk about some of my recent research on designing urban agroforestry. And, you know, of course, being an um, academic, I love to talk about my research. Uh, sorry, just having some problems here with my notes. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. Um, so 
Urban agriculture really combines my passions for plants, cities, and design. And urban agriculture can include urban farms, community gardens, vacant lot gardens, backyard gardens, indoor farms, rooftop farms. Um, it has many different permutations. Now, urban agriculture is multifunctional. And that's what makes it so significant in urban areas as part of the green infrastructure of the city. Um, at its foundation, of course, is the production of food. Um, however, urban agriculture does have cultural functions, contributing to the aesthetics of the city, fostering community development, and providing opportunities for recreation and cultural expression. It can also serve important ecological functions, including biodiversity conservation, stormwater regulation, and carbon sequestration, which is of course increasingly important with global climate change. Now a garden or farm um, is a complex system of interacting natural and human elements. This is how we agroecologists think of these systems. And we call them agroecosystems just to indicate their uh, sim similarity to a natural ecosystem. So biophysical elements include sun, soil, precipitation, the atmosphere, plants, animals, and microorganisms. Um, the gardener or farmer manages all of these elements to produce products for their own use or for the use of others. Um, consequently, because I'm studying what are really complex systems with these social and natural elements, um, I employ methods in my research from the social and natural sciences, um, including qualitative interviews, plant surveys, soil testing, and canopy analysis and other ecological methods. So my doctoral work in Chicago focused on the home gardens of African-American, Mexican origin, and Chinese origin households. <clears throat> now I didn't get my PhD until I was 50. Um, this was after working um, and teaching landscape architecture before going back to school and getting my PhD in crop sciences at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, and um, I've been at uh, the University of Rhode Island on the faculty um, for six years at this point. And I've continued my work in urban agriculture with research collaborators, including the Southside Community Land Trust in Providence, which manages over 50 community gardens and farms, including the Somerset Community Garden on the south side of Providence. Um, and then recently, of course, as you know from the introduction, I've become interested in urban agroforestry. And so you might ask, what is agroforestry? Well, this is a rather wordy definition from the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, um, but essentially it's growing crops with trees, um, where the trees themselves may be crops. They may be fruit or nut crops or um, crops um, for lumber or other timber products. So you're probably familiar with one agroforestry product from the supermarket or the coffee shop, um, shade coffee. And so this is an agroforestry system. Um, in rural areas, um, agroforestry also includes large scale systems like alley cropping. On the left, um, trees grown for timber or paper pulp are being grown with wheat in the alleys. On the right, apple trees are being grown with soybeans um, in China. So pasturing livestock with a tree crop is known as silvopasture. Um, there's even interest in increasing this practice in urban areas with animals like, for instance, goats. And finally, in forest farming, non-timber products like mushrooms or ginseng or golden seal are grown under the canopy of mature forest trees. Now, my research focuses on food forests, um, which have recently captured the imagination of the public and the media. Um, if you Google food forest, you'll probably find the image on the left, which shows the layers of the food forest from canopy trees to ground layer vegetation. In general, there um, are a minimum of, uh, there's a minimum of three layers to a food forest. Um, on the right is an article uh, on the Brown Mills food forest in Atlanta, um, which at six acres is the largest food forest in the United States. There's also a large one in Seattle. Now, combining woody plants with other crops, though, you know, sort of based on my experience in urban agriculture, has a long tradition in urban production systems. 
<clears throat> on the left is the Rainbow Beach Community Garden in Chicago. Um, it's on the south side and it's an original victory garden founded in the 1940s in a city park. Um, so it includes annual vegetables, berry bushes and fruit trees. And then on the right, we have a home garden of a Mexican origin family on the city's west side that was part of my doctoral research. Um, it reproduces in some ways the form of the Central American milpa um, or an agroforestry system that's found from Mexico into Central America. And so it includes um, sorghum, the herb papalo, fruit trees and grapevines at the edges. But going back even further, agroforestry has an even longer history in traditional agricultural practices, which can serve as an inspiration for agroecologists like me. Um, these include the Central American milpa cycle, shown on the left, and tropical home gardens, which inspired the concept of food forests initially in the permaculture movement. Now, traditional systems in turn were inspired by the observation of nature by traditional farmers, part particularly tropical forests, which have this you know, wonderful layered uh, vegetation, which you know, basically captures practically every photon of light that um, hits the forest from emerging canopy trees down to ground cover trees. And this is what food forests try to simulate. Um, and the idea is that um, because they do maximize the use of space and the use of sunlight um, that they yield more than a, a much simpler uh, urban agricultural system like an annual community garden or backyard vegetable garden. And urban agroforestry, in fact, does offer some advantages over annual urban agriculture, um, which really kind of dominates urban production. And uh, you know, this is why I've become interested in studying it. <clears throat> we do get in these systems increased biodiversity due to layering, because as you add more vegetation, you get more niches for you know, native birds and insects. You do have some mitigation too of the urban heat island effect potentially. Uh, cities are hotter than their surroundings, um, and this is due to the thermal mass of the city, all the, the pavement and the building masses. There's you know, potentially increased carbon sequestration in woody uh, material uh, in these systems. And there can be a greater sense of place and place attachment. People may be more fond of urban agroforestry sites than um, annual vegetable gardens, you know, because of the presence of trees, um, because people do like landscapes with trees and they do like biodiverse landscapes too. And there is also the opportunity to grow things other than annual vegetables in these systems, including tree fruits and nuts and also berries. Um, which can you know, contribute significantly, I think, or could to the diets of urban residents. Now, my recent work really kind of starts to integrate the theory, principles, and practices from diverse fields to create an evidence-based approach to multifunctional um, UAF, or urban agroforestry design. And so this graphic just illustrates some of the diverse disciplines that inform my approach. Um, and summarizes the design principles de developed from each discipline um, in this sort of like framework of hypotheses that I've basically developed along with my collaborator, Dr. Sarah Lovell, um, who is the director of the Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri. So we're combining um, you know, uh, uh, sort of theory and, and principles and practices from urban agroecology, um, environmental psychology, and landscape architecture. And so both Sarah and I have degrees in landscape architecture um, to develop a set of principles and design principles that will inform the development of culturally preferred multifunctional urban agroforestry sites, promoting food security, circular urban metabolism, and community empowerment. Um, that's a lot to expect of these urban agroforestry sites, um, but I think they're up to the challenge. So um, for this research, I, with um, Sarah, uh, basically initially conducted a review of the relevant literature in these different disciplines, urban agriculture, agroecology, ecology and forestry, environmental psychology, and landscape architecture, um, because we really wanted to root our design principles and hypotheses in the um, scholarly literature, because at this point, the practice, I would say, of urban food forestry kind of uh, exceeds the research that's been conducted on it. 
Um, we're also doing some qualitative assessments of existing self-identified urban community food forests in the United States. And so far, I've visited 30 different food forests across um, the Northeast and the Midwest. Um, last spring, um, I visited these sites, and I hope that this summer I'll be able to visit some sites on the West Coast. <clears throat> now, urban agriculture provides um, some models for remediating urban soils um, for urban agroforestry. Um, these soils are often highly disturbed. They can be high in pH, so they can be alkaline due to concrete in the soil. Um, and they're often contaminated with heavy metals and organic chemicals. Um, so on the left, we see um, an urban or, uh, I missed the A, anthropogenic soils. These are soils that um, you know, have developed, uh, uh, have developed under like um, human conditions in urban areas, uh, not under natural conditions. And on the right, um, we have a cap and fill system that could be used in urban agri agroforestry. Um, these are used in urban agriculture. Now, research in urban agriculture suggests that soil quality um, can be rapidly improved by amendment of the soil, the addition of yard and food waste compost. And in some really extreme cases, these cap and fill systems can be modified for use in agroforestry. Um, so in urban agriculture, basically the contaminated soil is capped with a geotextile fabric, um, which is sort of like landscape fabric or an impermeable membrane, a little bit like a pool liner. Um, and then clean compost soil is placed on top of the barrier. And that's what the um, urban growers grow their crops in. So this could be modified for urban agroforestry to make it safe to grow food in the city. Um, I think it's important too to use native fruit and nut plants, um, such as American plum on the left and native blueberries on the right, both native to Rhode Island. No, native plants support higher levels of native animal biodiversity than non-native plants. And it's important too, I think, to use resource plants that are native when possible. Resource plants provide habitat for pollinators or insect predators and other services um, when they're combined with fruiting and nut crops in these agroforestry systems. Now, environmental psychology tells us that people seek out environments with positive affordances. So an affordance is basically what the environment offers to humans and to non-humans, to animals, for instance. Um, so opportunities for social interaction and interacting with plants are important affordances in sites of everyday nature, like food forests. Uh, the Black Diamond Food Forest in Greensboro, North Carolina, which I visited last summer, for instance, includes a community garden area um, combining community garden plots with woody fruit and nut plants, a community orchard, and a central social space. It also includes some um, site-specific art, which really kind of enriches the environment and the experience of the site, and also potentially uh, place attachment for visitors. Forest gardens also sometimes include de dedicated social spaces, um, such as this picnicking area shaded by pecan trees on the left in the Browns Mill Food Forest in Atlanta, and an informal space under a mulberry tree on the right in the Rosewood Community Permaculture Food Forest. Key to the psychologically restorative properties of urban agroforestry um, or its ability to really um, psychologically restore um, sort of like um, attention um, is creating and to reduce stress is creating a sense of being away and of extent of being of putting one's cares behind oneself as one enters the food forest. And you know, this can be achieved through gateways and screening at the edges of the site um, so that you feel like you're stepping into another world when you step through the gateway. Um, as we can see here at the Unity Community Food Forest Project in Orange Park, Florida. Local communities, I found, may also recreate spe spaces um, that recall their place of origin in community gardens and also in, sometimes in food forests. Um, vibrant murals, for instance, in the Las Parcelas Community Garden and Food Forest in Philadelphia, for example, celebrate the neighborhood's ties to Puerto Rico. Um, on this, the structure on the right, 
um, recalls the casitas or little houses found in gardens in the Caribbean. And so this again is uh, a way of a strategy for creating a sense of being away in the food forest of leaving um, everyday cares and concerns behind. In my work in Chicago, I found that some backyard food forests recall the courtyard gardens of houses in Mexico. Um, they often featured fruit trees and potted ornamental and food plants, um, which is also evocative of these courtyard gardens in Mexico. Um, in one of these gardens, um, shown on the left, I found a food plant, pichueca, shown on the right, um, that hadn't pr uh, previously been described in cultivation in the scientific literature. So this is really quite exciting um, to, 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 to find this uh, plant that the gardener has transported from the Mexican state of Michoacan on her journey of migration 20 years previous to Chicago and had continued to grow it in her backyard. You know, it's created a sort of a material attachment, a connection to uh, her place of origin in Mexico. Now, diversity and complexity in urban agroforestry can be psychologically restorative, and it can also support high levels of biodiversity and be highly ecologically functional. Um, at the same time, it can be overwhelming and look messy without an underlying order. So I would argue, you know, it, trained in landscape architecture, that the application of classic design principles can create um, the order that people really kind of look for in the environment and that would make uh, urban agroforestry and food forests maybe more socially acceptable in a society where, of course, um, suburban uh, housing developments are dominated by lawn and scattered trees. Um, so these classic design principles include, for instance, you know, the idea of axis and of symmetry, hierarchy, rhythm and repetition, datum and transformation. You know, these are just essential design principles that, you know, landscape architects and architects and others uh, learn about in school, um, but that are also like reflected frequently in, you know, iconic gardens um, like Versailles outside of Paris um, or Italian Renaissance gardens, for instance. And the best example that I found of this um, in my field work was the Bloomington Community Orchard in Bloomington, Indiana, um, which has a relatively formal design of concentric circles. And at its core, it has a circular gathering space, um, the boundaries of which are defined by this like wonderful hedge of espaliered plum trees. So espaliered meaning that they're trained um, basically as a hedge on wires. Um, it's really quite, uh, you know, peaceful setting and highly ordered too. Now, there are some excellent examples of community food forests in Boston and New England, um, including the Elling Ellington Street Community Food Forest Garden, which has this like wonderful signage, of course, indicating that you are like entering a, a, a different space, a space um, separate from the city in some ways. It's a relatively young food forest, as most of them are in the United States. Um, I think the oldest one is in Asheville, uh, North Carolina, and it's the Dr. George Washington Carver Food Forest, and it dates to the 1990s. Um, but most of them are only about 10 years old. So these are some of my uh, students who worked with me this summer. We visited this food forest as part of a field trip. And so it includes the central uh, gathering space, um, a gazebo providing some shade, um, which is always welcome when you're out in the garden. Um, there are areas of native plants and almost native plants in the garden. Um, and it also includes a community garden, um, you know, which is basically dominated by annual vegetable plants, but isn't a good example of these different affordances um, that these uh, food forests and community gardens can offer um, to the public. Um, it also includes a medicinal garden. <clears throat> 
Um, and then the other um, food forest in Boston that I thought was quite nice. And what I like about these two food forests is that they are um, pocket parks, basically. Um, they've been established on vacant lots in the city. And so they provide you know, the nearby residents with every an opportunity to engage with everyday nature. You know, they're not set apart in some um, you know, much larger city park or regional park as some food forests are. Instead, they're integrated into the fabric of the city. Um, so this, like, you know, of course, Eggleston has this, like, uh, it's quite successful, I think, in terms of its design. And it has this, like, wonderful entry arbor that you kind of have to duck under um, the great vines to enter. And a really wonderful, colorful fence in front. Um, and it has a children's play area surrounded by native and non-native plants. We can see some milkweed, for instance, in the front, very important for uh, monarch butterflies. Um, it does have a food forest too, uh, proper, with apple trees and comfrey, dill, echinacea, um, uh, gooseberries and currants and other native and non-native plants. Um, and it does include a social space um, for adults and for family um, that includes a wood-fired oven, which is kind of wonderful. So you can make some pizzas and share them with other folks in the food forest. Now, um, I am um, developing, like a, along with a student in landscape architecture here at URI and a student in the Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems program, which I teach in, um, we are developing a food forest down at the URI agronomy farm. Um, so this is Plains, it's right along Plains Road. And um, we're calling it the Rhode Island Agrobiodiversity Garden at URI, um, because it's going to feature crops integral to the foodways of the state's diverse communities. Um, so it will include a settler's garden, an African diaspora garden, um, including plants from um, West Africa, um, the American South and the Caribbean, um, a South and Southeast Asian garden, uh, a milpa um, and a sort of uh, are uh, sort of uh, showcasing some of the food crops of Latin America um, and a native edible plant garden, uh, basically showcasing some of the plants that are native to um, Rhode Island and to the Northeast, um, but which are also edible. Um, so we're developing this this summer and we're going to be laying it out soon as, uh, soon as it starts, stops raining. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this. Now, um, I hope you've enjoyed this tour of my research and food forests. Um, while my research really kind of like focuses on larger scale community agroforestry, um, the concept is adaptable to home gardens. Um, and as I mentioned in the introductory video, I am uh, developing one of these at my home in Wakefield. It's very much a, a, a work in progress, definitely. Um, if you're interested in learning more about agroforestry, um, some resources include um, the URI Cooperative Extensions um, Native Plant Guide. Um, so I think it's down right now um, for maintenance for a week or two, according to the website. But um, this allows you to actually search for native edible plants, um, which is a great resource. The Center for Agroforestry at the University of Missouri has some great um, material on agroforestry in general and a, a short uh, blurb about urban agroforestry. Um, Orchard People is an interesting site. Um, it's, there's an associated podcast um, and also um, uh, blog posts uh, that discuss you know, growing fruit um, and nuts in the city and in rural areas too, um, uh, but also permaculture concepts and food forestry. Um, you can check out my article um, that I authored with uh, Dr. Lovell with Sarah, Designing Multifunctional Urban Agroforestry with People in Mind. Um, I like to think that it's written in an accessible fashion, but um, you know, I'm an ac academic in an ivory tower, so who knows? Um, but that is um, open access. And there are a number of other like interesting articles that are part of that special issue in urban agriculture and regional food systems that you might be interested in um, that you can access. And then, you know, if you just Google food forest on the um, web, you will find lots of uh, material about uh, urban food forestry. Um, because it is a permaculture concept. But again, as I mentioned before, I feel like the practice of uh, food forestry has really kind of ex uh, far uh, outstripped um, the research that's really needed on uh, food forests to make sure that they are multifunctional, that they are contributing to the ecological quality of urban environments. 
Now, I'd also like to take this opportunity, um, since you're a captive audience, right, um, to put in a plug for the Fall 2022 Honors Colloquium Lecture Series, Just Good Food, Creating Sustainable, Resilient, and Just Food Systems. So this will be held in the fall, Tuesday evenings at 7 p.m. Um, between 9.13 and 12.13. Um, it is open to the public. It has always been held at Edwards Hall. Um, this colloquium lecture series has been in existence for over 50 years. And um, you know, it's going to be quite exciting this year. And it will also be streamed too. And I think you'll all receive uh, email updates um, you know, as a result of participating in this uh, live stream event um, with updates on the uh, colloquium series. Um, but just some of the, uh, uh, it's going to bring, you know, sort of like national and nationally and internationally known speakers on uh, sort of concerns around food systems to URI. Um, so we're really excited about our lineup of speakers. Um, so it includes our opening keynote speaker, Winona LaDuc, who is an enrolled member of the Mississippi Band of the Anishinaabeg. Um, she lives and works on the White Earth Reservations, and she's an environmentalist and activist and the executive director of the NGO Honor the Earth. We're also excited about Dr. Ashante Reese, who is a professor in the Africa and African Diaspora Studies Department at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, she's the author of Black Food Geographies, and according to her faculty profile, works at the intersection of critical food studies and black geographies, examining the ways black people produce and navigate food related spaces. Um, we've also are going to be welcome, welcoming Sean Sherman, who is an Ogallala Lakota sous chef, known as the sous chef, great pun. Um, and he's a co cookbook author. Um, he's the founder of the indigenous food education business and caterer, the sous chef, and the nonprofit North American Traditional Indigenous Food Systems. And we're also going to have Tom be hosting Tom Philpot, who's the food and agriculture correspondent from Mother Jones. And Saru Jayaraman, um, she's the president of One Fair Wage and the director of the Food and Labor Research Center at the University of California, Berkeley. Um, she organizes and advocates for raising wages and working conditions um, for a restaurant and other service service workers. And of course, you know, during the pandemic, we have seen how you know important these um, service workers are. They are essential workers, um, and how you know uh, we really need to uh, respect um, uh, and, and provide for sustainable living uh, conditions for them. And then finally, um, we have Leah Penniman. She's a really well-known farmer, uh, author, educator, and food sovereignty activist. Um, she's the co-founder and co-director of Soul Fire Farm in Grafton, New York, and is the author of the book Farming While Black. Um, we're still scheduling a few more speakers, um, so you will receive some updates uh, via email. Um, and we'll send you a link to the colloquium's website, too, um, once our lineup is finalized. So now I think we'd like to open it up to some questions from the audience. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Thank you. It was really fascinating. And I'm particularly excited about your honors colloquium lineup. That looks absolutely um, so exciting. Um, I guess if I take the lead here and maybe start with a few questions, any of you in the audience can please feel free to include yours um, in the chat bar and we'll be happy to address them. Um, one question that I had, John, was that, you know, you mentioned that you grew up on a farm and your, um, your path to this profession took many turns, starting with uh, with a philosophy degree. And I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about how that informed your process um, as you moved through various, um, you know, various studies to land where you are today. Sure, I mean, I think one of the great things about um, urban agriculture is because it is mm -hmm. a multi 
plenary. And of course, like increasingly, we see food systems too as you know requiring you know multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary collaborations. Mm -hmm. And I feel like my background, you know, in philosophy and also the work that I um, did, I, I managed federal education studies and social science survey research for about ten years before I went back to school and got a second bachelor's in horticulture followed by my master's in landscape architecture, and then um, eventually my PhD in crop sciences. And I feel like all of that really kind of informed mm -hmm. you know, my approach to studying urban agriculture and food systems in general. Um, so I think it was really good, great, like sort of multidisciplinary preparation. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't realize it at the time, but um, uh, you know, for my current career. That's great. Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more um, about some of the research <clears throat> projects that you are currently engaged with, um, with using your um, your students' interests? Sure. Um, sure. Down at the University of Agronomy Farm, for instance, um, that include you know developing an urban adapted high tunnel system um, for. Uh, and I'm collaborating with the Southside Community Land Trust on this. And this is uh, target audience is basically market gardeners. Um, you know, the problem with like urban high tunnels is they're, uh, high tunnels are great because they do extend the season. Um, they're basically unheated plastic greenhouses, um, but often they're too large for urban environments. So we scaled it down to a much smaller footprint. And because urban soils are often so contaminated, we've uh, installed a raised bed like within the high tunnel. Um, filled with compost from the Rhode Island Resource Recovery Center. Um, and so we're comparing production within these high tunnels to production outside the high tunnels and raised beds. And, you know, my students uh, are helping me with this, uh, you know, collecting data, uh, planting, preparing the soil, um, and so forth during the summer months. So that's been great. Um, we're also doing some research in uh, Providence too, and surrounding communities, interviewing urban farmers and urban gardeners, including home gardeners, you know, about the crops that they're growing. Um, and really kind of like focusing too, to some extent on uh, immigrant gardeners and farmers, you know, who have uh, moved to the city often from tropical climates or subtropical climates and are adapting their traditional gardening and farming practices for a much different environment. So we're really interested. So I have, so we're working, um, I'm working with some collaborators, including Dr. Patrick Bauer and Amelva Trevino Pena and Julie Keller on um, setting up like a research teams of undergraduate students um, to go out and interview these gardeners and farmers and collect, you know, ecological data about their gardens, including what they're growing and how they're growing it. Um, so that's uh, been a pretty exciting project. Sounds amazing. Um, maybe you could speak a little bit to how you put your research into practice in your own um, yard. You mentioned that you were starting um, an agroforestry garden on your property. Sure. Okay. Well, uh, you know, I've been working on the inside of my house like, for the last six years since I moved here. I do live in Wakefield. Um, but now, you know, landscape architects, like, you know, their gardens always look like a mess, right? <laughs> I'm so busy during the summer at the URI agronomy farm um, and working in the interior of my house. I haven't had that much time to work on the exterior. Um, but I just started, you know, this year, uh, basically creating a food forest, applying some of those principles that, you know, I've developed based on my review of the literature and visiting um, food forests across the U.S. Um, in my side yard, um, also, you know, I, I basically have stopped mowing much of my yard and um, I live on the Saugatucket River and it's been really interesting to see what pops up, um, you know, after you stop, stop mowing. Um, fortunately, you know, uh, my neighbors are pretty tolerant um, because I do have a lot of goldenrod and other plants that, you know, people might think are weeds. Um, but I know that, you know, being part of that um, river corridor, it's so important to provide habitat for like songbirds, for instance, and other like native animal species. Um, and I've really kind of like seen that um, sort of uh, grow and develop uh, in the six years that I've been uh, you know, living in this house. I only wish the, the birds didn't start chirping at 3.30 in the morning <laughs> during the summer here in Rhode Island. That's the only downside um, to having basically wildlife habitat in your, in your backyard. 
That's great. And then while we're um, talking about your own um, your own private research and background, maybe you could speak a little bit to your background in landscape architecture that we share and how it's influenced your current research and work in agroecology. Sure. sure. Uh, um, so I did like graduate from the School of Natural Resources and Environment at the University of Michigan. Um, so there was like a really strong emphasis, of course, on ecology and um, also um, on, on uh, environmental planning as part of that degree. Um, one of my like uh, professors was Dr. Rachel Kaplan, who is a really well-known environmental psychologist. And I feel like that's kind of informed my approach um, to design, um, you know, grounding it in evidence-based practice from environmental psychology. Um, but then I also did get the opportunity after I practiced landscape architecture in Washington, D.C. Um, for a couple of years to um, teach landscape architecture as a lecturer at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And that I feel like really kind of like grounded me in um, design and design principles. And in fact, like those illustrations of the different design principles um, came from um, one of my colleagues at the University of Massachusetts, Jane Thurber. So I feel like that really kind of nicely complemented my uh, uh, background, uh, what I learned about environmental planning and ecology at the University of Michigan. Um, the, the design um, sort of principles I learned at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and so now I can kind of like bring that into my work on uh, urban green infrastructure, for instance, and um, sort of like developing, um, I guess, like designs and design principles that are sensitive to, um, uh, you know, the psychological needs of people and to um, the preferences that people have in terms of landscape. That's great, thank you. So if someone in the audience wants to incorporate food forestry techniques into their backyard, where would the best place to start be? Um, that's a really good question. Um, you know, in terms of what um, fruit and uh, nut um, and berry varieties do well um, in Rhode Island, um, I think that uh, our cooperative extension service, um, for instance, is a great resource. Um, so I consult Heather Fobert, um, who's a cooperative extension specialist, you know, to learn like about like what apple trees, for instance, are relatively disease resistant. Um, and that's so important because, you know, of course, in these, uh, if you're planting food forests, uh, usually in a populated area, you know, whether it's urban area or suburban area or an ur a rural area, it's usually associated with where people live. Um, you don't want to spray a lot of harmful chemicals, right? Um, and so it's important to you know, identify resistant varieties, disease and insect resistant varieties. Um, so I think that's a great start. Um, I, I think that that Orchard People um, website is a good resource. Um, and um, yeah, th that's why I say, and again, read my, read my article. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I look forward to it. Um, do food forests require different nutrients or soil enhance enhancements than uh, say a traditional garden might? Yeah, that's really yeah. an interesting question. And I think that it's something that's kind of understudied really and is an area for research um, because you know, to some extent like um, you know, fruit trees are relatively thrifty in terms of like nutrient use. Um, because they do withdraw nutrients from the leaves in the fall and store those nutrients in their woody um, stems and trunks and roots. And then, uh, you know, those like nutrients are, you know, uh, translocated or relocated to the leaves and fruit like uh, the following summer. Um, so it doesn't really, yeah, it hasn't really been explored very much. Um, and the fact is too, that you're growing uh, these plants in these polycultures. So you're mixing, you're combining different uh, tree and uh, uh, shrub species and also herbaceous and sometimes uh, perennial and sometimes annual plants. And so they're very intensive production systems, um, but there hasn't really been much research in terms of, you know, their response to the addition of nutrients. Um, I think definitely like compost that's been um, you know, uh, like, like we use the Rhode Island Resource Recovery Center organic certified compost um, at the, um, in, in our research down at the agronomy farm. Um, I think that's a great soil amendment. Um, you don't want to overdo it. Um, so, you know, maybe an inch or so a year. 
Um, and you can also apply things like wood chips to just as a surface mulch um, to uh, suppress weeds. You don't want to mix wood chips with your soil, though, because that will tie up nitrogen. Um, but if you leave them on the surface, that's good. Great, thank you. So building on that, do, um, do you think food forests require more or less water than say a traditional garden might? Sure, um, in growing some annual polycultures down at the farm, I have found that they probably require more water you know, because you do have more plants growing in um, the same space um, and you are layering um, the, the vegetation too. Um, so you're tucking you know, maybe berry bushes or um, uh, perennial crops like underneath the canopy of, of trees. Um, and so there could be more demand for water. Um, so I think it's something definitely to keep an eye on. Um, at the same time, you know, many of these species, you know, have relatively deep roots uh, if they're perennial species. So um, they can like draw water from deeper uh, uh, levels within the soil. Um, so you've got all of these factors. Again, I think it's an area for um, research, definitely. That's great, thank you. So how um, in a system that includes so many different size plants um, and diversity of plants, how does a farmer or a gardener balance the shade from the canopy so that the ground plants um, can thrive? Well, yeah, no, that's a great question too. Um, and something that I've thought about a lot also. And I'm looking forward to kind of experimenting with that um, down at the food forest that we're establishing at the agronomy farm and also like in my own um, food forest at home. Um, but, you know, I think that there are methods for pruning, for instance, peach trees. Uh, like often with fruit trees, you want to keep a relatively open canopy um, so that you do get good, um, you know, solar radiation interception by the fruit, for instance, um, within the canopy. So I think that sometimes sort of best practices for fruit trees can be also best practices for, for food forests. Um, because there is some thinning and pruning of the canopy that occurs. Um, so I would suggest, you know, definitely consulting with um, you know, resources from Cooperative Extension, you know, whether that's URI or another land grant university um, in terms of how to prune fruit trees um, for maximum, you know, fruit production, which often is, uh, does increase, uh, you know, light um, at the, at the gr at ground level. Great, thank you. Do yeah. you factor in um, the projected effects of climate change and global warming into your crop selections and you know, planning a food forest mm -hmm. that sort of will last the test of time? Is that something you actively consider? I mean, I think that's definitely something that should be considered. You know, so that uh, not only like can food forests, you know, help at some you know, very small level, um, mitigate climate change, um, that they also ought to be able to adapt to climate change because, you know, even if we stopped adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere today, you know, temperatures would continue to increase. Um, and I think that's probably most relevant, yes, in terms of um, the adaptability of the, um, of, the, of the perennial crops that you're growing, um, because, you know, some of those um, trees, for instance, can, last, can live many, many years, um, especially, you know, large nut trees, for instance. Um, and, um, and in terms of like native plants, this is something that I've thought about too, and, and many ecologists have, um, because, you know, what's native in Rhode Island right now might not be well adapted to, you know, conditions in Rhode Island 10 years from now. And so we might have to like look a, a bit further south um, when we're considering what, you know, native plants to plant, you know, in Rhode Island, for instance. Right. Um, I think we have a, an audience question here. Um, this is um, from a docent at Dunn Gardens in Seattle. Um, a long way away. Welcome. And uh, the question is, uh, a 100 plus year old forest garden designed by the Olmsted brothers, I guess that's where they were. Um, if, if you're Oh, okay. Well, if you're in Seattle this summer, please contact me if you'd like a tour. So that's an invite for you. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I would love to visit. <laughs> Great. I would love to visit. And um, I never had heard of like, you know, Dunn Gardens um, 
um, this hundred year old um, uh, forest garden. And yeah, that's awesome. I'd love to visit. And I am planning to go out to Seattle because I know of the beacon food, uh, food forest out there that I was going to visit another large food forest, but again, like a really young one compared to this Dunn Gardens, a um, hundred year, years old plus. That's awesome. Um, yeah. And um and, and, you know, I think this is a great point that, you know, this idea of green infrastructure, um, you know, really is, even though it seems like a relatively new concept, it is like, you know, much older concept, you know, dating back to, you know, um, uh, Frederick Law Olmsted, for instance, and the green necklace in um, Boston um, to mitigate stormwater there. Okay, thank you, Anne. Um, and thank you, John. So, could you uh, point to any good examples of food forest in the local areas that viewers might be able to visit aside from the ones you mentioned in Boston? Um, sure, there is one um, in Roger Williams Park um, that I didn't visit actually until the fall. So I didn't see it in all of its glory during the summer, um, but it is in Roger Williams Park and it's associated with um, the community garden in the park. And it was developed, I think as part of a URI um, undergraduate honors project and um, collaborating with um, Cooperative Extension and the Master Gardeners um, who um, implemented the project. Um, so I think that's a good example that you can visit too. And that does incorporate, you know, more than like some of these other food forests that I visited, native plants too. They're very sensitive to that, it's really nice. Yeah, that's great. Well, I know that um, despite all well-intended consequences, sometimes the introduction of um, of plants from far away places or even uh, close by different, you know, different uh, climate zones can have the unintended consequence of, of being a little too happy here in our local environment and um, become, you know, nuisance or invasive plants. Do you, how do you screen plants for their, um, for their compatibility with our, our local ecosystems. Sure. I mean, I think it's very sensitive to that. And one you know, potential issue in sort of like the permaculture food forest movement is that, you know, some um, food foresters do use uh, um, plants that are known to be invasive, like polonia, or um, I've even seen people recommending the use of autumn olive, um, for instance. Um, so it is... Uh, you know, good to, be, uh, you know, if you are going to plant a plant and if it's not native, you know, that you do do research on it. Um, there are noxious weed lists um, out there. There are, um, you know, lists that do kind of like document, you know, these more sort of thuggish um, non-native plants, for instance. Um, but if in doubt, you know, sort of probably the precautionary principle is um, optimal. Um, but yes, there are like also native plants that can be, um, a bit rambunctious in the garden. Great, thank you. So can you talk specifically about the URI Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Program for anyone sure, that might be interested? Sure, I'd love to. So um, I was hired actually six years ago, you know, to, to teach in the URI Sustainable Agriculture and Food Systems Program. You know, it is a relatively new undergraduate um, major here at the university, and um, it does have multiple tracks. Um, so um, reflecting the multidisciplinary nature of food systems, and it does you know, definitely take, of course, like a systems perspective. So looking at social and ecological and agricultural elements of the food system. Um, so there is a food and nutrition track um, within the program. There is a, a production track, uh, uh, which focuses on you know, crop production or livestock production or um, uh, fisheries uh, production. And there's also a food and society track, too, um, you know, because obviously, you know, food systems are embedded in culture and society. And so it's critical to understanding that context. Um, so, yeah, so it's a great degree and it's been really interesting to see it grow um, and to see, you know, some of the like amazing students who've come through the, the program. And we offer like sort of, I, I think it might have been mentioned in the, in the video too, you know, lots of hands-on learning too, yeah. um, either in the greenhouses here or down at the um, farms um, or at, um, uh, uh, yeah, or East Farm for um, fisheries. Thank you. Um, do you work with community partners in Rhode Island and beyond? 
Um, I do. Uh, partners in Rhode Island and beyond, including you know, Southside Community Land Trust has been my um, biggest uh, collaborator um, here, primary collaborator here in Rhode Island. Um, I have also done some work with Groundwork, for instance, um, in Central Falls, Pawtucket. Um, and I'm always looking to expand. Um, That's great. Well, I'm, which leads to my, my next question. Um, and I think that'll be our final one, unless we have any others from the audience, but I was curious as to whether or not there are any plans in the work to um, incorporate um, traditional ecological knowledge and um, collaboration with the Tomaquag Museum, which is going to be making its way um, onto land, you know, currently owned by URI, but that will be used by them long-term and is close by. So it seems like there's a real opportunity there. Yeah, no, I think that there definitely is. And I know that there I mean, you know, are some folks at the university who are working with them, um, you know, for our honors colloquium, um, Don Spears, um, you know, is um, on our organizing uh, committee and she is, um, you know, uh, part of the Narragansett tribe and uh, part of the Narragansett Food Sovereignty Initiative. Um, so I think there are lots of opportunities for collaborating on that. And yeah, traditional ecological knowledge, we all have to, you know, recognize, um, you know, is the source of, uh, you know, all of this uh, agroecological practice that we talk about now as like science or practice or movement, um, but it is based in this, uh, in traditional ecological knowledge. Um, and we have to like recognize that and respect that. Okay, well, um, I guess this is the end of the line for this presentation. Um, I could personally go on for hours. These are all subjects near and dear to my heart. Um, but we wanted to say thank you so much, Professor Taylor. Um, and as you mentioned at the beginning, um, folks will receive an email with a link with today's recording. Um, and with some more recommendations for further reading, if you'd like more information. And we also hope that you'll join uh, Professor Taylor for URI's 2022 Honors Colloquium presentations starting in September. So I'm sure that will be advertised further too. Yes. So again, we thank you so much for spending this uh, gloomy lunch hour with us and hope you found it as uh, enjoyable as I did. Thank you. Yes. Thank you everyone so much.